Well, thank you all for being here. Thank you, Yushia and Brandon for the invitation and Paloma for a very, very kind introduction. Um, as Paloma said, I'm going to be uh, sharing an excerpt from a forthcoming book, which I just got the cover for uh, about a week ago. So it's my first time sharing it. Um, and the book is based on 10 years of field work in Balaka, Malawi. And in um, writing this book, I've tried to do four different things. Um, the first is convey an empirical finding, which is I, what I think is the single most important thing I've learned in studying HIV in this community, which is that HIV needs to under, be understood as an epidemic of uncertainty, not simply as a medical issue. And I'll try to um, demonstrate the evidence that I have that an epidemic of HIV that affects between six and 10% of young adults creates an epidemic of uncertainty that affects approximately 40% of the population at any given point in time. And I try to show, I try to think about the uncertainty as the shadow of the objects, the HIV epidemic, the, the levels of HIV on a population. The second is a theoretical ambition trying to center uncertainty, um, which I'm treating as what people know that they don't know in our models of human behavior. And in this way, I think the case transcends HIV and is actually a more broad contribution. I tried to design the book um, to also give an export of for non-demographers, um, which I might not need to make a hard sell about in, uh, in, in, in this room, but a lot of people think that we just count things <laughs> day in and day out, which is not what we do. And um, I'd like the, uh, to demonstrate the value of demographic research and uh, demographic methods for thinking about questions of meaning. And finally, a methodolo methodological contribution is something that I'm referring to as population chatter, which is combining staple demographic methods with ethnographic approaches, but along um, pretty narrowly defined uh, parameters of what constitutes demographic topics. Um, so in this talk, I will introduce the Sagol Latanzi study and try to just situate the cohort. I will share an introductory vignette, um, how I opened the book that I believe illustrates these layers of uncertainty that one woman, uh, one of our respondents experiences. I'll show this primary finding about HIV prevalence in this community and the uncertainty in the cohort and how that uh, is, is dynamic over time and then link to HIV to outcomes, right? This is the why do we care, right? The argument is that not only is it like sort of interesting to know about uncertainty that people experience, but that uncertainty really motivates behaviors, right? And that that's something that we can um, and should try to measure and investigate um, more deliberately. So um, a lot of you, I mean, Malawi is, uh, there's, there's a lot of great demographic research um, uh, from, from, from Malawi, from uh, different groups of researchers, but. Balaga is situated um, in the Southern District, which is a matrilineal um, area. And it is um, high poverty, high fertility, and high HIV prevalence, even compared to the rest of Malawi. And this is where um, Balaka is situated. And thinking about this, um, and when, we, when I established this study, um, in collaboration with Sarah Yateman at the University of Colorado, Denver, and also with collaborators, um, Angela Chimwaza and Winford um, Masanjala at Chancellor College and Kamuzu um, College of Nursing in Malawi. Um, we established this study in Balaka town and we built a research center in order to um, enroll a cohort and follow them over what at that time was designed to be a three year period where we would interview women at four month intervals over, a th over this three year observation um, period, focusing on women, but also enrolling a random sample of men and in an ongoing way, enroll male partners, husbands and boyfriends, so we could understand the positions and the concerns and the opinions of the men that the women in our study were making decisions with. Um, and when we designed this study, we really took a different approach from like how the DHS was designed, right? This is, this is a highly contextualized approach. It is moving away from nationally representative ambitions, looking at the entire age range. And we were just focusing on HIV and fertility among young adults, women ages 15 to 25, um, in this single community sampling from as a simple random sample in a seven kilometer radius around the main um, center of town, which um, is constituted by a big market and um, also a uh, public hospital clinic. 
And one of the unique things about Balaka um, that people like to say is that in Balaka, every day is market day, right? In the neighboring town and in Cheu, market day is Wednesday and market day is Saturday. Um, in Ulongwe, which is about 30 minutes away, the closest town, uh, market day is on Monday. But in Balaka, every day is market day. People are constantly um, circulating, uh, com coming to, uh, to, to sell goods. Um, the, our research team was composed by about um, 30 interviewers, 20 data entry clerks, um, a few cleaners, a gardener because you only want to come to a space that like you know, kind of looks lovely. And we even had a granny on our staff. If you're doing a fertility study, you need someone to help young women uh, with the babies who will often come in tow. So we had, this is a, a you know, it gives you an idea of our, of, of our research team, men and women uh, um, in, in, in Balaka. So the research takes place at three intersections. First, in the slide where I showed Malawi, maybe you noticed how Malawi is in the shape of a flame. Um, the Malawian soccer team is called the Flames. Um, and Balaka is at a literal intersection. So there's one main road that goes all the way down Malawi, the M1, and bisects the country. And there's also a railroad that goes through from Mozambique into across Malawi um, into Zambia. And the reason that every day is market day is because a lot of goods are coming through this intersection of, um, of, 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 of trade and of transport for the country and connecting Tanzania in the north to uh, Mozambique again in the south. So this is uh, situated at a literal intersection where um, my research site is like just in the just just in the middle right there um, is where is where the TLT research site is located. The second is the substantive intersection that motivated us, which is that the years of um, peak HIV infections, right, new cases, which I'm not showing in this graph, I'm showing just HIV prevalence among young women, but the years that are most dangerous epidemiologically for young women are the years of peak fertility, right, the risks of contracting HIV and the desire to have wanted children in a high in a pronatalist context are synchronized, right? The abstain, be faithful, use condoms HIV approach to HIV prevention that has really saturated the Anglophone world isn't really designed with childbearing in mind, right? And young women who are starting their families want to be having children, right? Abstinence is off the, off the table, condoms are off the table, and being faithful isn't something that's entirely within a person's own control, right? We're talking about the relationship. So this substantive intersection, how do women navigate avoiding HIV during these peak years of infection while they're having the kids that they wanna have? This is what we designed the study to, um, to, to interrogate uh, during the first three years. And the third uh, intersection, um, I think about the social sciences or many people think about the social sciences as having different camps, right? One focusing on the kinds of questions that the quantitative estimation focused um, social scientists ask. And on the other side, um, the more ethnographic and perhaps theoretical approaches, right, where, um, where these scholars are asking different kinds of questions. And I would like to contribute some research that I think tries to erode that. And the tool or the approach that I'm using for this is um, something that I'm referring to as population chatter, which is the way that ordinary people um, interpret, perceive, narrate and debate the demographic phenomena around them and trying to um, be rather than thinking about demography this is something I worry about a lot actually sort of evolving into just a sort of generic quantitative social science I'm really interested in imposing perhaps some narrower um, parameters on the topics that we're interested in, um, focusing specifically on fertility, mortality, migration, health, and aging, for example, and um, but being a little bit more methodologically, let's call it ambidextrous in the tools that we use in order to, um, to address the questions. So, I wanna ask your patience while I share the introductory vignette that I used to open the book. And I'm going to read this vignette, which is extended. 
because I think the way that Katuma told this story to me is extraordinarily important. The details of her narration and the things that matter in the story. Uh, so it's a little unorthodox, I think, for our demography talk, but um, please, please bear with me. Um, the story is kicked off by a very standard question that researchers ask in sample surveys, specifically demographic research, about marital status, which we don't normally think about as a very complicated construct. The choices are straightforward. Never married, currently married, cohabiting, divorced, separated, or widowed. But Patuma's marriage was in, in, was in its complicated situation. And her vivid narration took me on a journey from uncertainty to certainty and then back again. So the context of this field note is interviewer calling me into the research room, um, telling me that I needed to speak to this respondent myself because she was so good at and so clever at telling stories. And also they didn't know what to put down for her marital status. Uh, so here are Pratuma's words. My husband and I have three children together. The first one, that was unplanned. I was only 15, but we stayed together and got married two years after the first one was born. All of my children are with this man and all of his children are with me. We've been happy together since 2006, but as of late, I have been doubting him. For example, one night he did not come home, which is something he had never done before. Then about a week later, another night. Maybe if he was a security guard, but my husband is a welder and welders don't work at night. I talked with him about it. I told him about my suspicions. I even called her on Coesway. These are the traditional marriage mediators, but they didn't help. They just said, well, after all, he is a man and that's how men sometimes behave. You just have to accept it. There's no need for you to end the marriage over some doubts, but I was not ready to accept that, not with this disease. My mother died from it when I was one year old. My father had already run away to Nsanjay district. I was raised by my granny, but since I am an orphan, my own children don't have grandparents who could raise them. From there, I started hearing rumors about his behavior, hearing that he had another partner. My friend called me and she told me she was standing by Mvutu Lodge watching my husband enter that area with a woman. And she advised me, she said, Patuma, you have to catch him red handed. So I started paying very close attention to where he was going and when, even following him from time to time. I usually just stay at home farming while he goes to work in town, but I started moving around to find out more about what he's really doing. Last week, I followed him to a certain place near where my friend had seen him, and indeed, he was meeting a woman there. The two of them went into the bush, you know, where people sometimes go to have sex. So I was right to have these doubts. Still, I didn't say anything to him. I just went home. The next day, I went to the bush in the late afternoon, and I hid there for hours. I was scared. I was scared of the bush buffalo trampling me. I was scared of being bitten by snakes and I was cold. After waiting for hours, probably six hours, I went home in the dark shivering. I was a mess. My husband was there at home and I told him I had been visiting a friend of ours who's at the hospital. I paid attention to how he was behaving and I decided to go again to the bush. I hid on the ground in those grasses a bit far away from the road. I had not eaten anything since the morning, so I was hungry and worried about snakes, but I had dressed more warmly the second time. I had prepared well to hide in the bush, like an animal or a mad person. Then I started thinking, what am I doing? I'm going to get killed, trampled by bush buffalo, or murdered by another mad person hiding in the bush. Just then, my husband appeared with that woman. The woman was carrying a plastic bag with something he had given her. I stayed quiet, and they took off their clothes and started doing sex. I moved closer, and when I saw that they were, you know, very busy, I crept near to pick up the trouser of my husband and the wrapper from the lady, and I crept to another spot to grab the bag. I wasn't close enough to get the underpants. I left those, and I snuck away. <laughs> I returned to my home very late in the dark, and I was not happy, but I was proud of myself. In the jumbo, in the, in the bag, he had brought her four eggs, some tomatoes, and a small bottle of cooking oil. In the morning, I did my chores as usual. I washed his trousers and the wrapper along with all the other clothes. I hung everything out to dry. When the laundry had dried, I took down my clothes and the children's clothes, but I left his trousers and that wrapper hanging outside the house. Later in the day, my husband came home and I welcomed him. I asked him if he would like to eat and he said that he would. So I brought out the bag he had given that lady and I slowly <laughs> took out the tomatoes and the eggs to start preparing the food. We were sitting in the front of the house. 
I got my knife and started chopping the tomatoes and I was looking at him, but staying quiet. And I asked him, please bring me some more charcoal for the stove so I can fry these eggs in this oil. He went around to where we keep the charcoal and from there he could see his trousers and her wrapper hanging on our clothesline. So now we are we're discussing whether to end the relationship. We are still staying in the house together. Naturally, my husband has called the marriage mediators to the house. They will be here either tomorrow or the next day. Today, your project has asked me a lot of questions, including about my marital status. But the truth is that today, I don't know whether I am married or whether this marriage has ended. Now, don't know in survey research, the dreaded 88s in our, um, in, in our, in our data files, are typically regarded as a problem for researchers, right? This is a violation of the assumption of perfect information. It's a source of missing data. It's a nuisance for analysts. But I would like us to consider instead that these don't know answers are a portal to understanding the social world more deeply. Now, I don't recommend that we fundamentally change the way that we ask about marital status in sample surveys. Patuma is, as you can tell from her narration, a very, very unusual and um, impressive person. But her difficulty answering the supposedly straightforward question about this basic demographic trait that we often take for granted speaks volumes about the force of uncertainty in everyday life. For the purposes of our research, I want to also um, point out the fact that this uncertainty is linked to another very salient uncertainty in, um, in, in her life, which is uncertainty about her HIV status, right? Mm -hmm. um, Patuma had been tested three times for HIV in the past year, twice during antenatal care and once when she started suspecting her husband of having other partners. She indicated in our survey that she has friends who are HIV positive and doing well thanks to antiretroviral therapy, which is now widely available in Balaka. If she tests positive, she believes that she would probably get the treatment she needs to live a long life. And she does not know her HIV status. Even upon receiving a negative result from the testing services we offered within our studies protocol, Patuma still articulated doubts about her HIV status. And although Patuma is unique and unusual, the fact that she is uncertain is a representative of what thousands of other women in Balaka are experiencing. She is navigating an epidemic of uncertainty. Now, I think it's important to point out that when I call AIDS an epidemic of uncertainty, I'm referring to something that has been ongoing for 30 or 40 years, right? In this sense, it's very distinct from our experience with COVID when we say the novel coronavirus of 2019, right? This is no longer new. And um, I want to um, show, oh, you know what? I've got these, there's a PowerPoint problem, but in Lexis style, like imagine the, the slide is supposed to have two, uh, two lines that go this way. Patuma and the rest of the TLT cohort, they're, they're born between 1984 and 1994, right? So they're born just as the first cases of HIV are registered. And the abbreviation there, UPE, is for um, Universal Primary Education, okay? So as they were young children, primary school for everyone in Malawi might not have been high quality, but everyone was going. So this is an, uh, the first cohort that is um, educated and they never knew life before HIV. The years of peak HIV AIDS related mortality in 2005 was the, we, we can hear this exactly from Katuma's narration, right? My mother, not with this disease, my mother died from it. My father was often in Sanjay. I was raised by my grandparents and my, and I don't have grandparents for my own children, right? This cohort experienced the, um, the, the worst of HIV mortality. And um, from, from 2000, about 2005, as when they were teenagers, right? So the, these very, very, very high levels of mortality characterized their entire childhood. Some of them were going to um, up to five and six funerals every month, right? Um, Nivirapine, single dose nivirapine to, um, to reduce mother to child transmission and antiretrovirals started becoming available in 2006. Um, and But those were for the lucky, the politically connected, and for the very, very, very sick, okay? 
Around 2011, a new um, policy became uh, uh, was was launched. It was innovated in Malawi. It's called Option B plus, and this is what um, this was a policy that prioritized HIV positive pregnant women for receiving antiretroviral therapy. This would and to stay on it for life. That means that it would reduce transmission to the children and it would, um, and because they were staying on it for life, they wouldn't be developing drug resistance, right? Just as we would with antibiotics going on and off it, on and off it. So this was a rationing, um, this was the rationing uh, logic of 2011 that was scaled up to 20 African countries actually before there was um, a lot of evidence about it, um, about, about how effective it was. And then in um, 2016, universal test and treat became the um, logic of treating HIV. So our respondents, Petuma, have like lived through, this is one epidemic, but these are a lot of different stages. Um, when we think about Petuma's life or all the TLT um, cohort in terms of the kinds of mortality that they, uh, that, that they have experienced, in the early years of the epidemic, people didn't understand, I mean, even scientists didn't understand how this was transmitted and why people were getting so sick, you know, eight to 10 years after they were infected. It was a period of deep confusion, right? But once the scientific knowledge was available, the knowledge that it was sexually transmitted and that it could be avoided, behavior change um, followed very, very quickly. And treatment became uh, treatment became uh, was 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 rolled out in uh, in in this sort of slow way at first. Um, but universal test and treat means that if you get an HIV positive diagnosis in Malawi, you will be started on antiretrovirals that same day, right? Regardless of pregnancy status, or underlying um, uh, your your um, immune system or any other, or ability to pay. So it is being transformed to a chronic and manageable um, um, uh, condition, which Petuma is very aware of, right, in her, in her, in her narration of this. So I want to show the um, demographic view of what happens to HIV for this cohort. We followed them for all 10 years, and the reason we were able to follow them past the initial three-year period is because these two big policy changes, first to option B+, plus, and then second to universal test and treat, made us reopen our questions, right? What we thought was true under the logic of scarce antiretrovirals would not necessarily be the case when pregnant women are prioritized for treatment or when there's treatment for everyone and people believe that there's treatment for everyone. So that's how we... Um, that's that's how that, that, that's how we motivated the extension of the study twice, once in 2015 and once in 2019. And I've broken down um, our cohort by into two age groups. And I want to show that at the very beginning of the study, you know, demographers know that averages, we were speaking about this at dinner last night, averages can seal a lot, right? And when I tell you that HIV prevalence in the cohort when we first started the study is 6%. That's a nice fact to know, and it is indeed true. However, it was less than 2% among the youngest cohort, and it was already close to 12% among the women 20 to 25. And the big, the big difference between these two groups is basically adolescents and married women, right? So this age cohort maps very, very strongly onto the marital pattern. Now, even though treatment is widely available, even though HIV prevalence is um, stable and declining, and we and the whole um, the global community is really behind these initiatives of uh, zero um, zero new cases, right? Um, getting to zero, um, we see rising HIV prevalence in the cohort, um, especially among the older women, from twelve percent to sixteen percent, then up to over twenty one percent. But these are the years in which all the new HIV infections happen for young women, right? Once they're past um, about age 30 in um, 2015, there are very few new infections. We see that like leveling off. For the younger women, um, we see that the um, having antiretrovirals and treatment in the population seems to give a very, very good story about um, HIV prevalence compared to their slightly older counterparts, right? HIV is rising for this cohort from 2%, 4%, 8%. 
and then up to 12%. And we don't know what it's going to look like if, if it will actually level off at about 12% or if it will continue to rise. But I want to show a caution here um, for all the good news, uh, declines in mortality, fewer new cases, that we enrolled a slightly younger cohort in um, 2019. We um, enrolled in a refresher uh, sample of women so that we could see our 20 to 25 year olds in 2019, um, um, how are they distinct from the 20 to 25 year olds we enrolled in 2009 at the very beginning of the study? And we see here, you know, these confidence intervals are overlapping. There's no difference, right? So there is not a clear improvement for the younger, for the for for the for the women who are slightly younger in 2019, meaning that HIV is not over, right? And prevalence of around 10% is um is is um it you don't declare victory right if 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 it, at, at 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 these prevalence levels so the point that i'd like to make about aids related and hiv related uncertainty you have this very concrete example of patuma who does not know her hiv status mm is there are five parts to my argument. The first is that it's something that we can measure. The second is that it's pervasive. I'll try to show evidence that it's impervious to biomedical solutions, that it persists over time, despite all of these different um, stages of the AIDS epidemic, and that it's consequential. And then in other parts of the book, I talk about other kinds of uncertainties, relationship uncertainties. So I'll talk about how this is layered with other kinds of uncertainty and hopefully persuade you that it's something we really need to understand. So how do you measure uncertainty? Well, in the first time I did field work, it was with Susan Watkins MDICP project in 2004. And these were the years of peak HIV related mortality. And we asked respondents in the MDICP, what's the likelihood you are infected with HIV right now? And pay attention to these don't know responses. 10% of the sample gave a don't know response. 5% refused to answer. Victor Agajanian fielded a wonderful study in Mozambique where up to 40% of the women in the study did not answer the likelihood, the Likert style likelihood question on, um, on, on the likelihood of infection really hurts a person to throw out 15% of data as missing data, right? Mm -hmm. So um, the way that we asked these questions was with, with, with Beans and um, published several papers with collaborators on this, but literally we gave our respondents Beans and a little plate. And uh, these photos are from our field work in 2019 when we had um, moved to tablet-based data entry. Um, and we asked them to tell us about the likelihood about certain things happening in their lives on a scale, re replying on a scale of zero to 10 with zero being no chance of the thing happening and 10 uh, being absolute certainty that the thing would happen. And um, you can see the respondent here putting the beans into the plate. We asked them things like, what's the likelihood that you go to the market um, before the sun sets today? What's the likelihood that you would win um, if we played a game of bow, which is like a traditional, um, which, 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 which is a, which is a, which is a fun uh, game and pastime. It's very popular in Balaka. So we asked them about, um, about things in their lives. Um, what's the likelihood that you will re-enroll in school if you're not schooling? Um, we asked them about a bunch of things and then we moved to sensitive questions. What's the likelihood that you are infected with HIV right now? the likelihood that you will become infected with HIV in the next year, the likelihood that you will become infected with HIV during your lifetime. And the basic distributions of this are very, very telling. This is, um, uh, you know, the basic histogram that I, that has, you know, really just inspired me to this, has carried me along for, for, for years. Um, at the first day of their first interview, 60% of the sample put zero beans, saying that they were confident that they weren't infected right now. And um, a pretty small proportion, about 6%, which is really closely aligned with, um, the, with, with actual HIV prevalence, told us that they were certain. Thinking about the next year, the proportion who is certain that they're not infected now drops by more than 20 percentage points, right? And we're asking them just at a single point in time in 2009 about their lifetimes, the modal answer was five beans, 
from this cohort of women, meaning that these are expressions of uncertainty about this, about this in, in, in their lives. What's great about this approach is in contrast to the 15 or 40% of people who say don't know when answering a question, two of our respondents out of 2,100, including the women and the men, wouldn't answer these questions with beans, right? It has predictive power for HIV status. Now, um, looking at the, um, we, we, we tested respondents for HIV in our study, and I'd like to show you um, the, the, the levels of you know, new infections um, based on the HIV bi biomarkers that we, that, that, that we collected. So you can see that um, women are infected at earlier ages than men. And this is the sort of, you know, cost proportional hazard model way of um, showing uh, new HIV infections over the first three years of the study, eight waves, um, based on the HIV um, biomarker result. Now, um, to think about uncertainty, I'd like to sort of make a comparison between actual HIV prevalence and uncertainty in this population by saying like, how are we gonna define it? Well, let's say acute uncertainty, people who put between four and six beans, if we think about the distribution and pull up the middle, those are the really uncertain people who don't know their status, right? And people who put one bean, you know, they're pretty confident they don't have it, but they have some doubts, or nine beans means like they think that they're basically living with this condition, but um, they may not have a clear diagnosis. So I would try to do the analyses looking at any uncertainty or acute uncertainty in the population. And I'd like to show you what this looks like, you know, in comparison to HIV infections, when we think about the proportion of people who put four to six beans at any point in the first three years of our study, it's more than half the population who's, and there's no gender difference here. It's very hard to not find a gender difference in um, demography in Sub-Saharan Africa. So uncertainty, unlike HIV, seems to be affecting both women and men in similar ways. Of course, when we expand the definition of acute, um, of any uncertainty from acute uncertainty, we're gonna have a steeper hazard function. And that is exactly what we see with a you know, very, very small um, gradient here. So it really shows you there are about 30 people left at the end of the three years um, who experience no uncertainty at any point. And it's, it's statistically nobody, right, um, who, who doesn't experience any uncertainty. Now, the third point I'd like to make is that this HIV uncertainty is pretty impervious to biomedical solutions, right? Know your status, right? Just test them. Go for a, a voluntary testing and counseling. You get your result. You you know speak with a healthcare worker. We have um, testing sites. You can be tested through antenatal care. You can be tested voluntarily in clinics. Just know your status, right? Find out so you can be a good sex partner, so that you can um, have ease about your status. Well, one of the things we did in our study was randomize when um, respondents would be would be tested. To one group, our respondents were tested every time they came to the research center for the interview. In group two, they were tested just in the middle. And in group three, they were tested only at the end of the study. And we hoped that the data from group three would help us understand how are people who aren't getting information about their HIV status through our study, like navigating the existing health infrastructure. Are they going to get tested in other places? Are they seeking out this information on their own? But for ethical reasons, it was really important for us to study, to, to test everyone, right, in uh, at some point in the study. Now, given this, we would expect, right, that people who are being tested and getting their results every time we talk to them, every four months in the context of the study, should have more certainty about their HIV status than those who are tested um, infrequently or not at all, right? Well, I didn't even bother to put confidence intervals um, on these because there's no difference um, in the uncertainty levels from people who are tested throughout the study and those who were tested only occasionally or tested in other places. And the same thing holds for our measure of acute, of, of, of any uncertainty. And this is very, you know, on the one hand, this is very surprising, right? Because we should get, to, uh, because testing should give us this kind of information. On the other hand, I think Petuma's story makes it very, very, very clear that the risks that many people live with are ongoing and that the information that we get from a test is retrospective, right? This is about 
the condition of um, my blood sample a couple of months ago because new infections may not reveal themselves in these tests for a period of weeks or for months. And that's part of the counseling, right? There's a window period. And we had this experience with COVID, right? You get a negative test. How confident does that make you feel, right? Um, given that you're breathing in and out, you know, all day long with, 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 with other folks. So um, the, um, the, so the, the, the testing, we cannot test our way out of this epidemic of uncertainty. Right. Um, the last point I'll make, I'm looking at the clock to make sure that we have ample time for, um, for, for questions here, is that it's persistent. And I think as a demographer, this is something that was very, very um, surprising to me. You know, you look at the, you've, you've heard me describe the conditions of, two, of the epidemic in 2009, um, where the respondents were 15 to 25, half of them were married, half of them were not very closely along an age gradient also. And there weren't very many, um, there wasn't very much treatment available. Then you also have seen evidence of like what people know about antiretrovirals, how they're getting them, how people are living long lives, having healthy babies. This has really changed a lot. Also the respondents in this cohort are getting older, but it's persistent. Um, this batch of histograms is showing what I showed in the first uh, slide, current uncertainty, the likelihood that you're infected right now, the likelihood that you're infected in coming year, and the likelihood that you would be infected in the lifetime. And what you see going down is the data from women in 2012, 2015, and 2019. Now, you can't make sense of all of these, but the basic thing is, if you look down in the column, the shapes don't change, right? These levels of uncertainty are like really, really sticky in the population, where it's about 11% infected, right? About 40% uncertain, even though the proportion of the, the specific people who are uncertain is changing, right? In that sense, it reminds me very, very much of the birth rate, right? Where it's pretty stable, even though it's different women having babies every year, right? That there is a sort of stickiness or a stability to this uncertainty as a feature of the population. Surprisingly, I see something very similar when I look at relationship uncertainty, the proportion of women who, um, who uh, think that their husbands, who are worried that their husbands are having other partners is around 11, 12% in this population every year. Now these women are moving in and out of those relations, or that uncertainty is getting resolved sometimes through divorce and a change of a partner or sometimes through a confrontation, right? And a demanding of um, faithfulness of a partner, but it never exceeds 15% and never in our sample does it fall below 10%. These are sort of stable features of this specific population. Now, the final point is that this is consequential. And Sarah Yateman and I wrote about this in a paper um, from 2011, where we tried to, to, where we showed that uncertainty followed this gradient, um, uh, that, that, that um, desired time to next child um, followed a gradient of uncertainty where uncertain women were accelerating was our argument that the acceleration started at just one bean and that um, beyond five beans there was basically very little difference um, between women who are HIV positive and those who were uncertain and this was kind of um, something that we wanted to communicate really to the clinical research which the, cl the clinicians separate the, pol the, the population in seropositive, right, people who have it, and seronegative, people who don't. So we really wanted to communicate that this large number, right, this large proportion of women in these uncertain states is that, 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 they, that they need to be considered differently. So building on this and using all of the data that we have for across all 10 years, um, I want to show you what the world looks like from the clinical view, right? When we use the biomarker data or if we use the beans data to separate out just people who are HIV positive, who know they're HIV positive from people who are seronegative. And we see, um, unsurprisingly, that self-rated health, right? The, uh, uh, I, I, I chose just four um, outcomes here that I think are widely used in the literature um, and health in particular, days missed of uh, work or school due to illness, overall life satisfaction, depression, and self-rate. So, we can see that um, life satisfaction is a little lower among those who are HIV positive. The numbers of days missed uh, for school uh, and self-rated health, we're not, we're not surprised to see these differences. But when we look at these outcomes on the spectrum of uncertainty, I think that there's a lot to learn here. 
only sick days follows like a nice linear gradient, um, self-rated health starts to plummet at the expression of uh, of uh, it start, starts to decline the expression of uncertainty at about three at the level of uh, about three beans. Um, depression um, kicks up at just one bean in terms of how uncertainty affects people. And um, life satisfaction, again, plummets at um, about five, starts to starts to change at about five beans in terms of thinking about of this. Um, so, you know, it's layered with other kinds of uncertainty and I'll show the evidence that I have and this is a non-traditional outcome for, um, for, 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 for hazard models, but women who know or suspect that their partners have other partners, right? This is the, or, or heard gossip when Patuma tells us that her friend calls her, right? And says like, hey, I see your husband out here in a place where like a lot of people are up to no good. Um, these are different ways of thinking about relationship um, uncertainty and how people navigate this in their lives. Again, men are affected, right? Not only women, but the experience for women or the prevalence of this type of uncertainty for women is, um, it's more prevalent and a little bit more severe. So in other parts of the book, I um, try to explore the way that these uncertainties are relevant to how we understand marriage, divorce, all the things that we're interested in, including migration. The, the, the overall point being like in, this un in these states of uncertainty, things happen, right? People do things. They move. They get married. They leave a partner, right? And that these are eventful times and it's an eventful status in many people's lives um, as they try to navigate these um, um, the, these, these these periods of uncertainty which are shared and pretty stable in interesting ways in this population and I would presume though I haven't studied many uh, um, other contexts also in others which is something for us to um, explore I think um, explore more concretely like um as a as, as a field so with that um you know i'll want to make sure that i mention um collaborators and, and funding sources and um really just take your take your questions thank you